continuing in Daniel chapter 8 this morning. We're going to look at the remainder of this vision and then the interpretation of it. Let me just go ahead and read this to you out of Daniel. And it came about when I, Daniel, had seen the vision that I sought to understand it, and behold, standing before me was one who looked like a man. And I heard the voice of a man between the banks of Uli, and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. So he came near to where I was standing, and when he came near, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Now while he was talking with me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand upright, and he said, Behold, I am going to let you know what will occur at the final period of the indignation for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. The ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat represents the the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. The The broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. And in the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise, insolent insolent and skilled in intrigue, and his power will be mighty, but not by his own power, and he will destroy to an extraordinary degree. He will destroy, or he will prosper and perform his will, and he will destroy mighty men and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. And he'll magnify himself in his heart, and he will destroy many while they are at ease. Even, he will even oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agency. And the vision of the evenings and mornings which has been told is true, but keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future." Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days, and I got up again and carried on the king's business, but I was astounded at the vision, and there was none to explain it. Let's pray. Lord, we come to your word, and Lord, we're so grateful for these things that are recorded in it. We're grateful also, Lord, in this passage, Lord God, we can see how the word that you spoke to Daniel was actually fulfilled, Lord, and and will yet again be fulfilled. We're so thankful, Father, that you decided to tell us what would happen before it did so that when it occurred, we could believe you, Lord, and we can trust every word that you say. Everything is going to happen just as you say it would, Lord, and we're so thankful for that. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Understanding is something that we all need a little bit of. I need a lot of it. And the more I read a lot of the Bible, the more I I realize that I know very little of it. I could probably quote you chapters and verses and tell you stories that I've read and things that I've remembered. I might even be able to do well on a Bible trivia game. But understanding is so much more than just knowing facts. And all of us need understanding. Here's what I want you to grasp in this. Even as Daniel was seeking to understand this, The very last verse in this chapter said, I was astounded at the vision and there was none to explain it. There were things that even Daniel could not understand and grasp. So it's okay for us to look at the scripture and read it and try to figure it out and still come up with, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what will happen and when it will occur, but I can tell you one thing that Daniel did know. And it's one thing that we can have our sure hope in. God knows exactly what's happening. We can trust the Lord to take care of what he wants to do in his time. And so what we need to do is what Daniel was doing. Daniel was going about the king's business. I know we're jumping all the way to the end of the sermon, but I want you to realize this. Go about our king's business. We need to be sharing the gospel and and sharing our faith and teaching others about Jesus. The sole mission of the church that the Lord has given is given to us in Matthew chapter 28. As we are going out into this world, we have one mission, and that's to make disciples. 
And if we're not about that, then all of the other things that we could be about are meaningless. I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing other things beyond that, but it starts with sharing the gospel and making disciples. And so, although we look at all of these different passages of Scripture, what I want us to grasp is Daniel, although he was exhausted and sick for many days and trying to figure out what was this vision that the Lord told him, he got up and he went about the king's business. So for you and me, let's Let's be about the king's business. Daniel saw this difficult vision. He was trying to grasp its meaning. And while he was trying to grasp its meaning, God sent someone to help him. Even though Daniel still didn't completely fully understand it, there was some explanation that God gave. Even if we don't understand, God's in control. He knows what's going to happen. Daniel wanted to know what was going to happen. Verse 15 says, I tried to. While I had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. We see in the verses before it, there was somebody that was there, and he's like, hey, what does this mean? And while he's trying to figure it out, he's just scratching his head. He hears the voice of a son of man. He hears the voice, one standing before him that looked like a man. And he hears a voice out of the banks of the river that he's standing in front of. Give this man understanding. Gabriel, give this man understanding. Other than Satan, who is named in the Bible, Gabriel is the first angel that is listed by name. The name Gabriel means God is my strong man or God is my hero. Gabriel shows up elsewhere in the Bible too. He shows up to Daniel at least one other time. And he also shows up to Mary and to Joseph. Gabriel is tied into the story of Jesus' birth because it's prophesied many, many years before Jesus would come. There were things that Daniel was seeing in this vision that would lead directly up to the coming of Christ, to the coming of the Messiah, to Jesus being born, and Jerusalem being ready for her king to appear. And when Gabriel came near, Daniel's response is one that I think we often overlook, but if you and I met an angel today, how do you think that you and I would respond? Most people out there flippantly would be like, hey, it's an angel. But I think if you really recognized what was going on, you would fall on your face too, and there would be fear. One thing that over and over again you hear when God shows up or the angel of the Lord shows up or another angel shows up and talks to a human, they often will say, do not be afraid. Why do you think they say that? Because there's great reason to fear. And this is not some idle happenstance. Daniel saw him. And he fell on his face. He fell on his face. Daniel fell on his face, and I believe this is the proper response. I seen a question that somebody had asked uh, this week, and it was it asked this question: If Jesus appeared before you today, what would be the first question you'd ask him? And I thought to myself, I probably wouldn't ask any question. I'd probably fall on my face. When the Lord shows up in the middle of a situation, He changes everything. When God sends an angelic messenger into a situation, He's doing it to change the situation or to influence it or to direct us. If far too many people play games with God and think that God is something that they can grasp and, and manipulate and, and God is, 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 uh, is like Santa Claus, you know? You ask Santa Claus for a gift and what does Santa Claus do? He gives it to you under the tree, right? It's almost like you're asking God for a direct, a direct withdrawal. Can I have this, Lord? And we approach God like this. But God is great and greatly to be feared. Yes, we can come before the Lord in our time of need and have confidence to ask Him whatever we want to ask Him. And we know that the Lord will provide. But let's honor and fear the Lord just a little bit more than we do and recognize that He is greater than any one of us, that He alone is sovereign. And we need to give Him that fear, that respect. He's told... Son of man, understand that the vision that you saw 
pertains to the time of the end. And as Daniel heard these words, he falls off into a deep sleep. I don't know about you, but my stress response when I'm completely stressed out is to go find somewhere to lay down and go to sleep. Now your stress response might be something completely different. I don't know what it is. Some people, when they're stressed out, they just, they just start talking. They don't know what else to do. They just, it's just stuff coming out of their mouth. They don't even know how to explain it. Other people, they go find some, you know, some ice cream. <laughs> I used to do that. Or, or they, they might go, go uh, off into the woods somewhere. They might go find their friends or go hang out with their parents. They have different stress responses. I think maybe Daniel was so overcome by this vision that he had his body just shut down on him. I don't know what else to do, so I guess well, I'm, I'm going to sleep. There's a blessing in this. He, he, he's just so stressed that he sinks into a deep sleep, but Gabriel touches him, makes him stand upright. Get on up, Daniel. Let me give you the strength you need. I recall in the other, other stories in the Old Testament, Elijah is stressed out. Jezebel is calling for his death, his assassination. And what does Elijah do? He flees, right? And the Bible says he flees and he's so exhausted from his flight that he falls down on the ground and just falls asleep. And when he wakes up, the angel of the Lord comes to him and feeds him a meal. And that meal, on that meal, he goes another 40 days into the wilderness. Oftentimes the Lord will show up in ways that we can't imagine when we are in a difficult time. And Daniel was in the middle of a difficult time. During the reign of Belshazzar, things weren't going great. At least Nebuchadnezzar came to his senses at the end of his reign, but Belshazzar was not. He was evil. And God was showing him what was going to happen beyond the reign of Belshazzar, even beyond the reign of the next king, Darius, and then the next king after them, Cyrus. The Persians would come in. The Medo-Persian Empire would come in and take over Babylon. Daniel was seeing things even beyond that. And it was so much that he didn't know what to do, and the Lord was using this angel to strengthen him. He says, Behold, I'm going to, I'm going to let you know. I'm going to give you understanding. What will occur in the final period of the indignation? The last end of the indignation, the word there is aharit za'am. It's the end, the after part, the last, the ultimate end, a later time. It's at the extremity. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen at the very end. We know the Bible tells us God is not like any of the other gods because the other gods are just wooden stone and they don't know anything. God tells us what will happen at the end from the very beginning. He tells us all of that. And he says, look, it pertains to the appointed time of the end. And the appointed time of the end is the Moed Kes. The Moed, the Moedim. Maybe you've heard that word. It's a fixed time, a season. It's a set time or place. It's an appointment. There's an appointed time that God says certain things will occur. Jesus was born at the right time, at the right place. Daniel was in Babylon at the right time, at the right place. You and I have been born in such a time as this. Esther was born for such a time as this. God has arranged history for certain things to occur at specific set points. You and I all understand what an appointment is. We've all had appointments. And there are certain days that you have to go and do something. Now, my brother had an appointment for a surgery last Wednesday and I was able to go and help him when he was needing that and I spent the day down there just waiting for my brother in New Orleans I was waiting for him to go through with his, his surgery he came out on the other side and he's doing good but that appointment came and he had to be ready for that there were appointed times that Daniel under, would come to understand that God was setting things up for them to occur this would happen at the final period of the indignation. Now, in context, what he's discussing is the rage of the little horn that Daniel saw in this vision. There would be the ram who would appear. 
Then there would be the goat that would appear. And then there would be four horns. And then there would be a little horn. And at the final end of the indignation of the little horn, there are certain things that would happen. And this would be many years in advance. And it happened exactly like God said. Daniel sought understanding. And the angel Gabriel was sent to give him understanding. If any of us lacks wisdom, the Bible says that we should ask of God. Because what the Lord will do is He'll give us wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But if we ask God for wisdom, God isn't going to sit up here and say, What are you, stupid? <laughs> you don't understand? Like I showed you the vision. No, Daniel, Daniel knew he didn't understand. But moreover than that, God knew that Daniel didn't understand. You know, oftentimes Jesus would come and speak to the people in parables. Do you think the people understood? The disciples didn't even understand. And they had to ask Jesus, help us understand what in the world are you saying? And so oftentimes the Lord will tell us a story, tell us something, a show, a vision in the Bible, and it'll be repeated. And we'll have to think about it for a long time and consider it. I had a former pastor of mine who every time I would go and visit him, he would, he would often tell me the same stories over and over and over again. And I got to thinking, like, why do you keep telling me the same story? Well, it's because there's a nugget of truth in there that I needed to grasp, and maybe it was because I was hard-headed, and I needed to hear it over and over again to understand it, right? And so I think Daniel, not only did he write this down, but he considered it. Daniel sought understanding, and you and I should seek understanding too. Events have appointed times. We, we see this in here. There is an appointed time for the end. And so Daniel said, look, this is what's going on. The angel Gabriel said, Daniel, this is what's going on and this is what's going to happen. Context the inter determines the interpretation here. There was a period of indignation that Daniel would have to be aware of. Of course, he would be gone by then, but he's writing it down for those in the future. There's a period of indignation and there's something that would happen at the very end of that. But before that occurred... Medo-Persian kings would come in and they would take over Babylon. Now consider the setting for this. We talked about it last week. Where is Daniel? Daniel is asleep in Babylon. In his vision, he's standing by the Ulai River, which is in Susa, the capital city of Persia. The Lord is showing him, taking him from his sleep in Babylon... He's in Persia in his dream and he's looking forward to things that will happen in the future. God is revealing some things to him. The ram would come. He'd have two horns. But God doesn't just dwell on the ram. God continues on with this explanation through Gabriel. There was a shaggy goat that would come that represents the kingdom of Greece. Now, your Bible says Greece, but the, the Hebrew version of this, or the Aramaic, says Yavon. Now, who is Yavon? Where is that? If you are to look on a map today, we would look at the Aegean Sea, and we would see that Greece is on the, the left side of that, off to the west of the Aegean Sea. And classical Greece was not only... The islands of the Aegean, and yes, Athens and Sparta and all of that, and the Peloponnese, the areas over there. But it was also the, the eastern side of that area as well, what we would consider modern Turkey. It was the cities of Izmir, the cities of Ephesus, the cities that are listed in the book of Revelation. All of those cities and areas around the Aegean was known as Greece, Ionia, Yavon. The word Yavon, that name comes from Genesis 10. And Genesis 10 is a fascinating viewpoint of how the world has been divided up. And if you turn over there real quick, we'll just look at it just for a second. Out of Yavon, we, have, we, we see where he comes from. Genesis chapter 10, we see this right after the flood. Noah's three sons have a bunch of kids and they end up dividing the world up among themselves. But in chapter 10, verse 2, the sons of Japheth were Gomer and Magog, Madai and Yavon, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. And you've probably heard of Magog. You may have heard of Meshach. Maybe you've heard of some of the others. 
But Javan, or Yavan, shows up in here. And the sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togarmah. And the sons of Javan were Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these, the coastlands of the nations were separated into the, their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. It's a brief overlook of how the world was divided after the flood and after the Tower of Babel. But God has put every single one of us where he wants us for the right time and the right place. Paul later would recognize this in, in Acts chapter 16. God has appointed beforehand our boundaries and our habitations. You may think that you're just simply blessed to have been born in South Mississippi because God wanted to bless you, right? But no, God chose you to be born here. Just like he chose me not to be one of you. I'm kidding. I got here as quick as I could. I'm just playing around. <laughs> but God decided from eternity past for you to be born here and me to be born there and for our paths to cross. God knows exactly where we're going to be, when we're going to be there, and he knows where we'll never be. And you may want to go there your whole life. Pick a spot that you'd like to go visit. God knows whether or not you'll go there. And he might decide that you'll never end up there. Because who's in control of that? Well, God is. The kingdom of Greece, Yvonne, will be this kingdom that will come. The sons of Javan, Elisha, this would be uh, the Hellenes, this is all Greece. It's Carthage or Elissa, the Aeolians, the uh, area of Sicily, Thessaly, and southern Italy. This is where those sons of Javan went to. Tarshish we find in the book of Jonah, right? Jonah sought to go from Joppa and just go as far away from Nineveh as he possibly could imagine. He got into a boat and he decided to go as far west as he could imagine and he would wanted to go to Spain, Tarsessos or Cadiz. It could also be Cilicia or Sardinia and refer to the Etruscans of central Italy. The sons of, of Noah went all over the world. But what about Kittim? Kittim shows up in all, all sorts of different places and, and this will make sense here in just a minute. But Kittim starts with Cyprus, the Aegean Islands, the seafaring West Mediterraneans, and includes such as the Romans, Macedonians, and Seleucid Greeks. If you've ever read the book of 1 Maccabees, which is not in our Bible, it's one of the apocryphal books. Now here's what I want you to understand. The apocrypha does not mean don't read this. It's history. It's just not included in the biblical canon because the biblical canon, all of the books in our Bible really focus in on Jesus and the coming of Jesus and what led to the coming of Christ. And when you think about all of the books that are here, there's so much prophecy concerning Jesus. But the book of 1st and 2nd Maccabees is a historical narrative of what happened. And in Maccabees, 1st Maccabees chapter 1, it says that Alexander the Great, who is this first king of Greece, coming across and wiping out Medo-Persian Empire, it says he comes from Kittim. Macedonia is an area just north of what we know of Greece today. But Kittim also is a bit bigger than that. It does contain certain areas of southern uh, Italy, Naples, Tuscany, the Sabines. And we know from history that Kittim appoints Zepho, the son of Eliphaz, the son of Esau, as their king. And he assumes the name Janus Saturnus. And he dwelt on Capitoline Hill, which is one of the seven hills of Rome. Now, all of this makes a difference because the Bible, especially Daniel, speaks of the seven-hilled city. It speaks of the, the problems that come out of Rome. And there is a long hatred of the sons of Esau against Israel. There's a reason why Rome, when they came in and took over Israel, 
in the intermittent time between the Maccabeans and Jesus that they labeled the area where Jesus was living as Syria, Palestina. And there are many people today who are saying the, Palest the Palestinians need their own state. And you know what? God's will is going to be accomplished in that. And even if the Palestinians were to have their own state, there will not be any peace until Jesus comes because only Jesus will make all those things right. The Romans called it Palestina for the Philistines who were long-standing enemies of Israel. Esau hates the Jewish people. Well, one of the things that happened out of that is they developed a celebration. January is named January because of Janus, the two-faced god of the Romans. Because we've made January the first of our year, the first uh, month of the year. It looks forward and looks back. But Janus Saturn Saturnus, the Saturnalia was a celebration in December it starts on December 17th and would go to December 23rd. Now, when we look at all of our calendar and our holidays and all the things that we celebrate, some of the things that we celebrate, are, they're, just, they're just civic holidays. There are some people who will make a really big deal about whether or not Christians should celebrate certain holidays. Like, should we celebrate our birthday? I remember when I was in elementary school, there was a girl that, I, that was in my class who was, uh, she was Jehovah Witness, and she didn't celebrate her own birthday. And I thought to myself, that's really strange. You don't celebrate your own birthday? And then I realized, you know, they don't even celebrate Christmas. And, and that just kind of blew my mind, because I'm like, why would you not want to celebrate Christmas? I'm like a kid, you know, why would you not want to celebrate Christmas? You don't celebrate your own birthday, and you don't celebrate Christmas? Like, that, where's the fun in all of that? And there are some people real legalistic, and they'll be like, look, you don't need to celebrate Thanksgiving or, or Fourth of July or, or all of these things. And what we need to grasp is there are holidays that are celebrated by certain people that are just, that's just their days. Day of the Dead, right? That, that's a Mexican holiday. Uh, we, we celebrate Cinco de Mayo by going out and eating tacos, right? But that's not our holiday. I mean, England celebrates Boxing Day. Well, we don't celebrate that. That's their Christmas, right? That's the Christmas for the servants. Well, the Saturnalia was a Roman holiday, and it was a, it was a, it was a time frame that they would celebrate in remembrance of Jadus Saturnus. They were celebrating the founding of Rome by the, by the grandson of Esau. And then it became, in, in uh, 274 AD, the, the um, emperor at the time, labeled or uh, appointed December 25th as Sol Invictus, the birthday of the unconquerable sun. And what we have to understand is that after the flood, Noah set aside certain days to celebrate with his children. They would celebrate the equinoxes. They would celebrate the longest day of the year and the shortest day of the year. They would recognize the changing of the seasons. And on those days, they would stop they would spend all day worshiping the Lord and getting together with their family and thanking God for what He's done. But you and I both know what happens over time, right? Those things that are intended to be good become corrupted. And it becomes something completely different. Like the way we celebrate Christmas right now, if you went back 100 years, they would not celebrate Christmas like we do. If you went back 200 years, Christmas would not be celebrated like it is here. In fact, if you went back all the way to the days of the pilgrims and you tried to celebrate Christmas, you'd be put in jail. Because the Protestant pilgrims looked at Christmas and said, that's a Catholic holiday and we're not Catholic. And for many generations, Christmas was not even a celebration. The Christians celebrated Easter. Not Easter, but Passover, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And, and our society just likes to take all of those things and meld them together. And now we've got, Chris, you know, we've got Santa Claus who wears red and white and he has reindeer. That, where, where's that at? And look, I don't want to be legalistic about it. You can celebrate whatever you want to. I mean, Nett's, Nett's so glad that we, she's able to put up a tree and lights on it. And there's some things that we can look at within the, our celebrations and go, okay, well, that's where that's from. The lights are there because, you know, Martin Luther put a candle on a tree and 
You know, she's looking up at the stars of heaven and glorifying God. Where some people would look at a tree and say, well, that's a pagan, that's a pagan celebration. God knows what you're celebrating. God knows what you're not. But I think all of us understand, just as we would, we would agree that Santa Claus probably does not live at the North Pole, although there are some people who think that he does. And we know that Santa Claus is based off a real person, Nicholas of Myra, that G December 25th is not Jesus' birthday. There's no historical record of when Jesus' birth actually was. In our society today, we celebrate it. Well, the Romans celebrated December 25th as Sol Invictus. It was a holiday made up after many generations of people worshiping on the Saturnalia, where they were celebrating Saturn. The longest, the longest night of the year, the sun was coming back out and it was getting a little bit higher up in the air. Well, what about the Jews? What do they celebrate around this time of year? Well, they celebrate Hanukkah. You know, Hanukkah is all about what Daniel saw here. Daniel saw the final period of this indignation, someone coming and desecrating the temple and doing all of these things. And that's what the book of First and Second Maccabees is about. The historical record shows what happened. And everything that is, uh, is prophesied here in verse 23 through 28 or 26 happens within that time frame. The temple's desecrated. This man comes in who is an insolent person. He, he glorifies himself, sets up a statue of himself, sets up a statue of Jupiter, and he sets up himself as God. And, and they celebrate Hanukkah, which is the festival of lights, when the Maccabees cleanse the temple after the 2300 morning and evenings of desecration. And for eight days... That one jar of oil that should have lasted one day lasted for eight. What day of the, of the Hebrew year what does that start on? Does anybody know? You see, it changes every year for us. It starts on Kislev 25. The 25th of what our December would be. They started celebrating that before Rome ever started celebrating anything on the 25th. And so for many Jewish people, they look at Christmas, Sol Invictus, as the hidden hatred of Rome against Israel. You go a little bit deeper in history and you see all of these things that come together. God knows exactly what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. Satan cannot create anything. He only corrupts that which is created. And the days that the Lord has appointed to be celebrated that are good, Satan comes behind and he corrupts them and gets people's focused on other things. We just need to be really careful what we celebrate. Well, the other son of, of, uh, of Javan is Dodanim, and it's the area of the island of Rhodes, the Dardanelles, the Balkans, Serbia, Albania, it's the area of the Black Sea. So Javan's children are from North Africa and Spain all the way to Turkey and all of the islands of the Mediterranean. Out of the kingdom of Greece, Javan, would come four kingdoms. There was the Ptolemies out of Egypt, the Seleucids out of Mesopotamia, the kingdom of Antigonus out of Turkey, and Cassander out of Macedonia. And these four generals, who were under Alexander the Great, gained their power after a long struggle of about 20 years after Alexander dies, and they all have their own little kingdom. History records that Antiochus IV comes out of the Seleucids and he fulfills all of this. In the latter reign of their period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise who is insolent and skilled in intrigue, and this is exactly who he was. He had a mighty power, but it wasn't his own, and he did destroy to an extraordinary degree. He did all sorts of evil. And I'll share with you some of the things that he did. But what he did there was he destroyed a lot of mighty men and through his shrewdness, he caused deceit to prosper. He saw to it that people who were following the Lord no longer followed the Lord. He opposed the prince of princes and he was the one who ended the Aaronic priesthood line. When you think about this, there's a lot of things that were going on in those days. And if you were Daniel, seeing this through a vision, it would probably 
drain you as well. There would be a lot of things that you would look at and go, why, why, Lord? Why would you allow this to occur? Why would these things happen? And even as verse 25 says, he'll be broken without human agency. Nobody killed Antiochus IV, but God did. God struck him down with disease. When Alexander the Great came to Jerusalem after fighting in Gaza and in Tyre, he was met with the high priests who had dressed in all of their ceremonial garb. And as soon as he saw him, he recognized him from a dream that he himself had. And the high priest handed Alexander this passage from the scroll of Daniel. And he said, look, this is what prophesies of you. And from there, Alexander left Jerusalem and he went and he conquered the Medo-Persians. Alexander understood something that others did not. If God said it would happen, it'll happen exactly like he said it would. So he went and conquered. This was 332 B.C. Antiochus IV did not worship God, did not honor God. He set himself up as God, called himself Epiphanes, God appearing. But we know that when Jesus was born, he was called Emmanuel, God with us. He proved himself to be God where Antiochus did not. Antiochus was just a man. He fell to disease, just as the passage declared. When we fight against God, we lose. When we look at the politics of this world, we need to recognize when people set themselves up against God or in the place of God, they will always lose. So don't elevate yourself more highly than you ought. This is why Paul says in the New Testament, let's not think of, each, of ourselves more highly than we ought to, right? We're like the grass that fades away, and it fades away quick. We're here today, gone tomorrow, but the Lord lasts forever. This man was insolent. He had intrigue. He was mighty. He destroyed to an extraordinary degree. He did all of those things. The time of the end will come. And Daniel understood that. He just, he just didn't know what would happen and when it would occur. The last priest of the lineage of Aaron was a man named Onias III. He had a brother whose name was Jason. I find this interesting. But Jason's, Jason is the Greek name for Jesus. I'm not Jesus. <laughs> I will never proclaim myself to be Jesus. But Jason changed his name from Jesus to Jason because he was Hellenistic. He was bought into the program of Antiochus IV. Onias III said, no, we need to be what God wants us to be. We need to resist the world. We need to not do the worldly things. Well, the influence of Antiochus so corrupted the populace of Jerusalem that the city of Jerusalem changed its name. They built a gymnasium right next to the temple. They basically changed their, their way of living from Judaism all the way into being like everybody else. Why did Israel want a king? during the days of King Saul. It's because they wanted to be like all the other nations around him, right? What does God tell us to do in regards to the world? Come out of them. Be separate. We don't need to be like the world. Look, we live in the world. We're of the world. We, we grew up in this world. There's no way that we can't not be Americans. Like, that's how we think. That's how we were raised. But the Lord wants us to not live like the world around us. Well, his people had completely rejected him at this point. Think of Daniel seeing this through his vision, all of this stuff happening. And so here's what happens. 169 BC, Antiochus comes in, conquers Egypt, except for Alexandria. 
And then he's forced to leave Egypt and Cyprus after, after the Romans come in and defeat his allies. Well, Antiochus knew what the Romans wanted to do. The long-term vision of Rome was to conquer the world. And Antiochus knew this because he was a captive in Rome for years. In fact, there comes a point where he's in, uh, in Egypt and his friend who's Roman, who's an, a Roman ambassador, comes to him and says, look, you need to withdraw. And Antiochus says, I will, but give me some time to think about it. And so his friend took his sword out and drew a circle around drew a circle around Antiochus. He drew a line around Antiochus in the sand, and he said, you'll make your decision before you cross this line. So this whole idea of a line in the sand comes from Antiochus. You're going to decide now, or you won't leave this box. And Antiochus, in his defeat and in his humility, decided to take out his anger and rage on Jerusalem. And it's from there that he goes to Jerusalem and destroys Jerusalem. He conquers the temple. He sets up a, a, a statue of Jupiter in the, in the, in the temple. He, he uh, forces the, the priests to eat pig flesh and sacrifice to pagan gods. He orders a construction of a fortress on the south side of the temple. And he's, he succeeds. He's, he's succeeding in everything that he can to conquer Jerusalem. He opposes the king of kings, the prince of princes, sets himself up as God to be worshipped. 2300 evenings and mornings pass. And while he's away fighting in, in Persia, the Maccabean revolt happens. And at the very end of that, they reconsecrate the temple, just as God said that they would. Antiochus was known for encouraging Greek culture and institutions. He was ruthless. He decreed that, that Jewish people could not celebrate their traditional practices. There, there, was a mo there were a couple mothers who brought their children to be circumcised. And that was outlawed. And so he was such a cruel person that he paraded them through the town with their babies, and this was not a very nice parade, and threw them off the pinnacle of the temple. He destroyed to an extraordinary degree. But he was broken without human agency. The Lord struck him down. On December 25th, 25th of Kislev of 164 BC, the temple was reconsecrated. It was cleansed. The festival of lights in Jerusalem, the feast of dedication that we find Jesus in the book of John, chapter 10, walking around in Jerusalem. This is chapter 10 of John, of John verse 22. At the time that the feast of dedication took place in Jerusalem, it was winter, and Jesus was walking through the temple in the portico of Solomon. And I can just imagine Jesus walking through this temple remembering the fulfillment of all these prophecies, looking around at all of this and knowing that it wouldn't be very much longer that he himself would die on the cross. And the Jews came up to Jesus and said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, plainly tell us. And he said, I told you, but you didn't believe me. I told you already, but you didn't believe me. The works that I do, these bear witness of, believe me, of, of me. But if you don't believe, it's because you're not my sheep. Oh, that made him mad. Now remember, the, uh, the abomination that caused desolation that Antiochus set up was a statue of Jupiter proclaiming Jupiter to be God. And now here's Jesus in the temple proclaiming himself to be God. And so the Jewish people looked at Jesus and said, He's anathema, He's cursed. And the Jews today do not love Jesus. They view Him as a false prophet, as the worst of the false messiahs. Jesus says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them unto me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. 
What do you think the response from the Jews was that day? They took up stones to stone Jesus. Jesus was declaring that he was God, and he asked them, I showed you many good works from the Father, from which of, which, for, for which of these are you stoning me? And the Jews answered him and said, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus was showing him showing them that He was God. And the day that Jesus showed up in the temple, proclaiming Himself to be God among them, was the day that the temple was rededicated, not too very, very far from the day that the, the, uh, on the calendar when the abomination of desolation that Antiochus set up happened. It was a very sensitive time. In fact, when the Maccabees came in and cleansed the temple, they took all of the stones of that former altar and they went and buried them somewhere in Jerusalem because they said, we don't even know what to do with these. We believe that at some point God will tell us what to do with these stones. And these stones from the original altar may be in the future cleansed, reconsecrated, and used again by the coming Messiah. Perhaps that's what Jesus will do. Daniel did not completely understand. And you and I may never completely understand every single prophecy in the Bible. Daniel was so exhausted and he was sick for days. But I want you to know God fulfilled all of that. Daniel was astounded. Nobody could explain any of what he saw. I'm sure he probably sat down, maybe with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were still around. He probably talked with them about it. Guys, what do you think about this? And nobody could explain it. I may never fully grasp the timelines. I may never grasp all of the events. I may never see all of those things the way that God wants it to be seen. The people of the first century did not see that Jesus would be born as he was. They could not understand or grasp that there would be kings or wise men that would come from Persia and give gifts to Jesus being born of a ba in, a, in a manger in, in Bethlehem. They didn't see that coming. Although it was recorded in the Bible that these things would happen. You and I don't need to know everything for us to be able to trust God. All of us just simply need to listen to what God says and just be about the king's business till he returns. Will you and I be about that? Will you and I go and make disciples? Will you and I share the gospel? Will you and I serve Jesus faithfully until the very end? There's a lost and dying world that surrounds us that needs to know the good news about Jesus. And what is the good news? The good news is that you and I are sinners. I don't know how we can make that good news, right? That's bad news. But the good news is that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and He rose again the third day so that if we would repent and call on Him, He would forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all its righteousness, and He would give us justification and He would make us new. And all He's asking is that we would repent and trust Him. Now my hope is that each one of us perhaps has done that, but there might be someone here who hasn't. We need to pray for them, that the Lord would just grip their heart and do what only He can, and then if the Lord is calling, that we would answer. We need to pray. Pray.